Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is May 28, 1977, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 24. This issue concludes the second year of the AUDIO LETTER, but only if we are blessed by a true miracle will the third year ever be completed, because as I speak to you today, a tragedy has already been set in motion that is beyond human comprehension. Not since last July and August 1976, when the Soviet Union began planting underwater bombs and missiles in our own territorial waters, has the situation been so grave and urgent as it is now. For that reason, I will dispense with any further introduction today in order to discuss these three topics. Topic No. 1 The Fall of Babylon Revisited Topic No. 2 The Handwriting on the Wall for America and Topic No. 3 Water the Ultimate Weapon Topic No. 1 We live today in a world that grows more complex and more confusing with each passing day. But in spite of that, we Americans are fond of praising ourselves for the great man-made wonders of our age, and whenever the obvious dangers to our continued existence as a nation prey on our minds, we are always reminded that we, the great United States, have already survived fully two centuries since our Republic was founded. And scarcely a day goes by that we are not reassured by our rulers, elected and otherwise, that we are the mightiest nation on earth. Our technology, we are told day in and day out, is so wonderful that it is impossible that any other nation on earth, especially the poor backward Soviet Union, might surpass us in any important way. In other words, we are technologically impregnable. Unless we become prematurely concerned over the impact of the recent radical changes in our weather, certain news reports recently have told incredible lies to the effect that the United States has a two-year surplus of grains in our storage bins. In all of this, the behavior of the United States today is like that of countless civilizations before us just before they perished. And in some respects the greatest similarity of all is with that of ancient Babylon just before its abrupt fall from power. The origins of the United States, unlike Babylon, were strongly moral and spiritual in content and the system of government set forth in the United States Constitution, which freed men in a way unparalleled in human history, was conceived by men who understood man's place within God's creation. This heritage still lives today in the hearts of many Americans, but it's rapidly being snuffed out under the bondage of rulers who are superimposing the pattern of ancient Babylon on our beloved land. The Babylonian pattern is totally evil, and those who choose to bow down to such satanic rule thereby make themselves part of it. The origins of ancient Babylon are lost in the midst of time, perhaps 5,000 years ago, but it reached its peak around 600 B.C., at which time it was undisputed as the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. The city of Babylon was the Rome of its day, the most important trading center, the most powerful military force, the greatest cultural influence, and even a center of tourism because of its remarkable hanging gardens and other man-made wonders. The huge city of Babylon was surrounded by city walls so high and so thick that they were impregnable by any military technology of that day. And inside the city there was a two-year supply of food, 
making any attempted siege against Babylon unattractive. And there was no lack of water either, because no less than the mighty river Euphrates ran through the city. Yes, Babylon was powerful, wealthy, and so secure in material terms that potential adversaries were hardly even taken seriously. Even when it became clear that the increasingly powerful joint empire of the Medes and the Persians had designs on Babylon, there was no real concern. With all their means of protection against invasion and their unrivaled prosperity, the Babylonian attitude was simply, it couldn't happen here. And so when the Medo-Persian army of Cyrus and Darius laid siege to Babylon, the only response of the ruler of Babylon with debauchery, feasting, drunkenness, and mocking any real power greater than himself. At this point, we're told, the Babylonian feast was interrupted by the appearance of a hand in mid-air, writing words on the wall that said Babylon's rule was at an end, that its ruler had been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and that the kingdom would be divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The handwriting on the wall said the impossible was about to happen. Babylon, the impregnable city, was about to fall. How could this be? No one in Babylon had ever had experience with invasion, and so could not imagine such a thing. And yet, within a few short hours before the drunken feast even ended, the impossible happened. First, the water level in the mighty Euphrates River flowing through the middle of Babylon started dropping rapidly. It dwindled to a trickle and soon stopped altogether. Cyrus the Persian had worked out of sight of Babylon and had diverted the Euphrates out of its normal channel. Now the great impregnable walls of Babylon were left with huge openings namely the riverbed no longer filled with water. And in marched the Medo-Persian army, conquering Babylon without resistance. And today the United States is under siege by the Soviet Union with the cooperation from within of Quislings. We are threatened by the joint Rockefeller-Soviet Empire just as Babylon was besieged by the joint Medo-Persian Empire. And now as then we are told there is nothing to worry about. It just couldn't happen here. But my friends, just as happened in ancient Babylon, the handwriting is now on the wall for America. The America we know today is a perversion of the pattern originally laid down for our beloved land. And America as we know it is about to come to an end. And as with ancient Babylon, water is our Achilles heel and the means by which we are to be reduced to surrender without a fight. Topic No. 2 Not long ago the Carter Administration's Ambassador to the United Nations, Andy Young, made the remarkable statement that, quote, Communism has never been a threat to me." Unquote. He also has a habit of patting Cuba on the back for the so-called stabilizing influence of Cuban troops in Africa, and otherwise has repeatedly shown a very amiable attitude toward world Communism. Many Americans have wondered why Andy Young is allowed to go on saying such things without being restrained in any way by Jimmy Carter. But Carter has now answered that in a major foreign policy speech given at the University of Notre Dame on May 22, 1977. This speech is as important as the famous Iron Curtain speech of Sir Winston Churchill a generation ago at Fulton, Missouri. White House aides stated that the Carter speech at Notre Dame was specifically intended to, quote, send some messages to foreign governments, unquote, and it did. The foreign press is filled with headlines about the major turn that has just been taken in American foreign policy, yet here at home many Americans have not grasped what has happened. The most basic theme of that Carter speech 
is an elaborate echo of Andy Young's statement, that is, we are no longer afraid of Communism. Is this because Communism is withering and dying? One need only look at a map to see how fast Communism is eating up the world. What Jimmy Carter is telling us and the world is, we can get along with Communism. And just to prove it, one of America's most important efficient intelligence operations to keep an eye on Soviet naval movements and other important matters is being closed down. This intelligence unit, known as Task Force 157 and run by the United States Navy, has a budget of well under one-tenth of one percent of that of the CIA, and yet it is being shut down supposedly for a budgetary reason. Meanwhile the signs of war to come are all around us. So great are the dangers facing us that military men are speaking up in increasing numbers in an effort to warn America before disaster arrives. Since they are subject to military law and subordinate to civilians who do not want them to speak up, it's no small thing to speak out in this way. So consider what Major General John K. Singlob said in an interview on May 19, 1977. General Singlob, the third-ranking United States Army General in Korea, said, quote, If we withdraw our ground forces on the schedule suggested, it will lead to war." Unquote. And why did General Singlob speak up? His answer was, quote, The question asked after United States setbacks in Korea and Vietnam was, Did the military people in the know express themselves loudly and clearly enough that the decision makers understood? We want to make sure. Unquote. In speaking this way, General Singlob was doing no more than expressing the consensus of practically every knowledgeable military man about the Korean situation. For example, the same Washington Post article that quoted General Singlob also quoted another Headquarters Army officer in Korea as saying about the Carter plan to withdraw our troops, quote, I don't know anybody who is not staggered by it. There's no military or strategic logic for withdrawal. Unquote. The plan to withdraw from South Korea, in other words, is strictly political, in line with the newly announced American foreign policy that it is no longer afraid of Communism. The reason General Singlob's words had such an impact in this country is that his name was attached to his warnings. The words I just quoted from the other anonymous Army officer is just as startling as what General Singlob said but people will just read those words once, frown, and then forget about it. But everyone knows about General Singlob's warnings because, deliberately or otherwise, he allowed himself to be identified as the source of the warnings, and for daring to warn us, he was promptly relieved of his Korean command by Jimmy Carter. The situation in Korea illustrates the direction in which events are now moving but other events are due to occur long before the pullout of our troops from South Korea. The real threat to our security is no longer in Korea or in Europe, but right here in our own backyard. Another military man who is actively trying to warn America is Major General George Keegan, who retired at the beginning of this year as Chief of Air Force Intelligence. General Keegan is one of the West's greatest intelligence analysts, and the story he has to tell should be continuous headline news throughout our nation. General Keegan has been speaking on radio and television talk shows, giving speeches, accepting interviews, in short, using every channel open to him in an effort to wake up America before it is too late. One of his most comprehensive and important speeches was the one delivered on March 11, 1977 at a press conference sponsored by the American Security Council here in Washington, D.C. To find out in more detail what General Keegan had to say, I would urge every American to obtain a copy of that speech. Write to the American Security Council, Boston, Virginia, 22713 for information. It was published as the April 1977 Washington Report 
of the American Security Council were frequently told by syndicated columnists that the CIA is our first line of defense, but General Keegan said in his speech, quote, the ultimate function of a nation's intelligence is to render carefully assessed judgments and forecasts regarding the threat. When I look back upon my experience with this nation's highest estimating body, I have the impression of having taken part in a Charles Dickens novel. The sense of make-believe and unreality has to be experienced to be believed." Unquote. Further on he says, quote, The intelligence estimators, heavily dominated by the CIA and the State Department, have been wrong about Soviet purposes in pursuing détente. They have been shockingly deficient in their estimates of the risks and the advantages to the United States and the free world of the so-called technology exchange with the Soviet Union." Unquote. And he adds, quote, if there has been a Watergate in this country, and there has been, but ignored, it has been in the monumentally incompetent judgmental processes of this Government regarding the nature, character, and growth of the Soviet threat as it has evolved from year to year." Unquote. General Keegan goes on to make crystal clear that the deficiencies in our intelligence estimates are not due to any lack of our ability to collect information or to analyze it technically. The problem instead has to do with what is done with that information. To begin with, the intelligence estimation process at the highest levels in America today is not objective, but is manipulated to fit political purposes. In General Keegan's words, and I quote, the United States Intelligence Estimative Process cannot be understood unless it is first appreciated that National Intelligence Estimates must perform three functions. First, they must support the decisions of the President, both for the record of history and for the avoidance of impeachment. Second, they must substantiate or help to justify the decisions of the White House Office of Management and Budget. Finally, the intelligence estimates must, whatever other purpose they may serve, rationalize the foreign security policy initiatives of the Secretary of State." Unquote. Continuing, General Keegan says, quote, I appreciate that those are extremely important allegations to make. But I submit to you today that it is not possible to understand the workings of the United States intelligence community unless one is willing to open his mind to the influence of those three factors." Unquote. This situation is illustrated vividly by General Keegan's discussion of the controversy over the Soviet Backfire Bomber. As I've told you for many months, the supersonic Backfire is an intercontinental strategic bomber capable of striking the United States with nuclear weapons. General Keegan says, quote, The central issue all along has been whether this bomber posed a threat to the United States. The Soviets argued that it did not, and the CIA and State Department rather consistently accepted the Soviet point of view." Unquote. General Keegan proceeded to acquire analysis of the backfire's capability from, quote, the most competent analysts in the free world." Unquote. The available intelligence information was provided to three American aircraft companies with experience building strategic bombers, plus, for good measure, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Aircraft Establishment in England. And the results, quote, every single one of these organizations independently agreed that the backfire had an intercontinental capability. Yet my word was not good enough, nor was that of the American and British heavy bomber designers and builders. CIA and State chose to believe the Soviets." Unquote. General Keegan is not in a position to express it this way, my friends, but his description of the backfire controversy illustrates what I've been trying to tell you over the months, that the Rockefeller cartel has more faith in the Soviet Union 
than in our own United States. Finally, General Keegan explains, the sheer weight of analysis made it more and more apparent that the backfire was truly intercontinental. Quote, However, CIA and State now judged that the Soviet Union had no intention of using the backfire as an intercontinental bomber." Unquote. This in spite of the fact that the second model of the backfire has been given even greater range. The history of the backfire controversy up to this point is very disgraceful and still generally unknown to the American people. But listen now to the final chapter in General Keegan's words, and I quote, Seemingly undaunted by the most extensive analysis of a foreign bomber ever performed in the United States, the CIA in one final super-secret uncoordinated effort proceeded over a period of 18 months to undertake an analysis designed to prove that the backfire bomber could not reach the United States. This effort in which small bits and pieces of controlled information were provided to McDonnell Douglas Aircraft, designer and builder of fighters, represents one of the most artful contrivances I have ever observed. It is one which I suspect may have been designed to salvage a SALT Accord. Finally, when the CIA surprised everyone by surfacing its new analysis, Months of painful and extensive analysis were required to show that the books had been rigged. Artificially high G loadings had been assigned to the design of the backfire, along with excessive engine drag and other factors which were designed to reduce range." Unquote. And this, my friends, is how our so-called first line of defense, the CIA, looks after America's national security to the tune of over $20 billion a year. Elsewhere in his talk General Keegan also spells out the dangerous manner in which our military intelligence capabilities have been progressively over-centralized, compartmentalized, and taken over by civilians, quote, who understand little about the horrors of war. And these are people who understand even less about military doctrine, strategy, and weapons, unquote. The product of all these trends described by General Keegan is the very intelligence gap that I discussed with General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when I met with him last September. For years General Keegan has tried in vain to obtain a series of post-mortem audits on the predictive and estimated record of the United States intelligence community. The audit would be performed by qualified but disinterested outsiders with no links to the intelligence community so that their work would be unbiased. Quoting General Keegan again, Such audits would record scrupulously where we had been wrong, where we had been right, where we had fallen short of the mark, or where we had exaggerated. Yet every such suggestion had been met with disdain and has been resisted in the most resounding vocal and emotional way." Unquote. He might as well have asked for an honest audit of Fort Knox. General Keegan's speech contains many more things than there is time to discuss in this tape, and they're all important. He reveals many things about the military capabilities of both the Soviet Union and the United States that you will never hear through the usual news channels, but they all boil down to just two major conclusions backed up by many, many facts. One conclusion is that Soviet military capabilities vastly exceed what we are being led to believe, both in terms of quantity and quality. The other conclusion is that the Soviet Union is firmly convinced that a nation can fight a nuclear war and continue afterward as a functioning society. And based on that conclusion, from a Soviet study undertaken after World War II, the Soviet Union has for more than 20 years been preparing militarily to fight and win a nuclear war. The American approach, on the other hand, is only to deter such a war, even though General Keegan says, quote, 
I am unaware of a single definitive effort ever conducted by the United States to determine precisely and in great detail what it would take to deter." Unquote. General Keegan also explains another very important principle. It has to do with official judgments of the strategic balance and carries over into public pronouncements by the Pentagon. This is the tacit rule requiring the use of so-called agreed national intelligence. Says General Keegan, quote, agreed national intelligence is derived by committee, contains little that is controversial except in some footnote or dissent, and it rarely contains meaningful reference to the dynamics of strategic competition in terms of the new weapons, new forces, and new capabilities being evolved by the Soviet Union." Unquote. Thus, whenever new threats are involved, whether it be the awesome Particle Beam weapon warned about by General Keegan, or the Soviet underwater missiles I've been warning about for nearly a year, Pentagon disclaimers dare not be accepted at face value today without challenge. Those who accept these denials are playing straight into the hands of our nation's deadliest enemies. Meanwhile, the build-up toward the start of Nuclear War I is gaining momentum. Two months ago Nelson Rockefeller visited Israel to help speed up the preparations for a Middle East war. By mid-April Israeli troops had begun massive maneuvers in the Sinai with live ammunition. Reserves had been called up, and Egyptian maneuvers were soon underway as well in the western Sinai. These maneuvers, headline news in Europe and Britain, have gone unmentioned in the United States except for the crash in the Sinai of a huge helicopter killing 56 Israeli soldiers. Then just a few days ago the extremists came to power by way of the recent Israeli elections. The Middle East is now a powder keg as a result, and the Carter Administration is rapidly disengaging and disassociating itself from Israel. So when the nuclear strike from the Sinai against Arab oil wells takes place, it will not be recognized by the world or by most Americans for what it really is. Perhaps General Keegan was also right about one other thing he said in his speech, quote, We have reached a point in America where I believe we are almost incapable, culturally, of being warned, unquote. If so, my friends, it is we, the United States of America, who will have been weighed in the balances and found wanting like ancient Babylon. Topic No. 3 When the sun came up on southeastern Idaho one day almost a year ago, it looked like the start of just another beautiful late spring day. It was Saturday and two fishermen were looking forward to a relaxing day in the shadow of the new Teton Dam. The dam, over 300 feet high, had been completed the previous fall except for a few finishing touches that remained and had been gradually filling up with water during the winter. Now, due to the runoff of melting snow in the mountains, it was almost full. Further downstream from the dam tens of thousands of people were going about their business. Some puttered around their houses doing weekend chores, while others were at work at businesses or on farms. But for the construction crew who arrived for work on the Teton Dam site that morning of June 5, 1976, it was a different story. At about 7.30 a.m. it was discovered that a sizable leak had sprung, not through the dam itself but through the section of mountain on one side where the dam was anchored. This was reported immediately to the proper authorities, who directed that steps be taken immediately to start lowering the water level behind the dam. Why the leak had appeared so suddenly was a puzzle, since inspection of the dam by personnel around 9 o'clock the previous evening had turned up nothing wrong. But there was no time to solve this puzzle because soon a second leak developed. Like the first, this second leak also appeared to break through the anchoring mountainside rather than the dam itself. Now the situation began to deteriorate at an alarming rate. Soon a leak found its way through the earthen dam itself, and a growing torrent of water gushed from it. 
Two bulldozers race to that location to try to stop the flow by moving more earth into position, but the leak grew so fast that the bulldozers were lost, the operators leaping and scrambling to safety barely in time to save themselves. Like a nightmare come true, the Teton Dam crumbled, collapsed, and released tons of water into the valley below. The day ended abruptly in tragedy for the two fishermen and others who lost their lives as well. For two days flood waters from that ruined dam continued to spread, ultimately covering an area of 300 square miles, including several towns and 50,000 acres of farmland. One of the major purposes of the Teton Dam, like many others around our country, had been flood control. Now the man-made flood unleashed by the collapsed dam had caused damage estimated to be in the range of $350 to $500 million in addition to the loss of life. The bursting of the Teton Dam provided America with a preview on a very small scale of what the Soviet Union plans to do to our entire country. Last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 23 I reported hard intelligence I had received to the effect that 21 major lakes and dams in 10 Western States have hydrogen Soviet bombs planted in them. But the information I gave you then, my friends, was only the beginning. Since recording AUDIO LETTER No. 23, I have been under an avalanche of ongoing intelligence reports concerning the ongoing Soviet program of planting nuclear weapons in our inland lakes and reservoirs. I can now reveal that this Soviet program began at a relatively slow, careful pace as much as 18 months ago. For example, a Soviet nuclear device was planted over a year ago at a dam known as the Dales on the Columbia River east of Portland, Oregon, and it is still there now. The Teton Dam disaster appeared to be just a great big accident but it brought to everyone's attention the fact that dams can be made to collapse under certain conditions and that the consequences are devastating. Meanwhile the border of Idaho with Canada has become an important entry point for Soviet agents who are bringing nuclear bombs into this country. On Monday, May 16, I received an alert from my intelligence sources that Soviet agents were at that time in the process of transporting nuclear weapons into the northern United States by truck through several entry portals along the Canadian border. The greatest focus of that activity was at the Idaho entry points of Port Hill and East Port. For the next several days I was in frequent contact with my intelligence contacts in Canada who were taking very definite action to find and stop these Soviet intruders. But here in the United States our attention is being focused on our border with Mexico by the manufactured distraction of illegal immigrants. At the same time we are undergoing a wholesale invasion along our border with Canada by the Soviet Union, and not one thing is being done about it by the United States. By late that first day, May 16, at least 16 Soviet vehicles carrying nuclear weapons were known to have crossed into the United States from Canada through entry portals into Idaho and Montana. Meanwhile, seven more were on Canadian Highway 3 from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, heading toward Port Hill and East Port, Idaho to enter the United States. By that time the origination point in the Vancouver area had been narrowed down to a barge in Horseshoe Bay. The Canadians took care of the situation on their side of the border by stopping and inspecting trucks in the appropriate area, and by early May 18 all seven trucks driven by Soviet agents had been stopped and rounded up just short of the border. At that point, however, their next step was to wait for further instructions from Ottawa, and I have not yet been informed as to what further action was taken. Meanwhile, the only public hint of what was going on was contained in a short item printed in Vancouver newspapers on May 19. 
It stated that trucks were being stopped and searched along Route 3, but did not give the reason. For my Canadian friends, now you know. But it was a different and sad story here in the United States. The Federal Government is, be is taking no action whatsoever, proving that there is a continuing collusion between the Rockefeller Empire and the Soviet Empire. At the State level one would hope that the chances of obtaining action would be a little better, but so far that has not been the case. Concerned citizens who have tried to bring my warnings to the attention of their Governors and other high State officials have encountered basically two reactions. One is that, quote, this is something for the Federal Government, so we'll refer it to them, unquote. And of course there it ends. The other main response is to the effect, quote, naturally even if we did find a bomb in the lake next to the dam, we would not make it public. After all, we don't want to excite the people." Unquote. But my friends, that is like an air raid warden refusing to turn on the siren during an attack because it might frighten people. At the local level, though, one would hope that some action could still be expected, but no. During the period of May 16 I tried in every possible way to get local and state police in northern Idaho to simply check out some very specific reports I had been given, but to no avail. Several Soviet trucks were known to be heading southward in northern Idaho toward the town of Sandpoint, and I was informed of the approximate positions where it should have been possible to intercept them on the highway. But when I relayed these reports to State and local police in the area, both directly and through a brave local citizen in that area, it turned out to be impossible to persuade them to take action. As one police sergeant told me, quote, we're wondering why the Federal Government hasn't stepped in on this, unquote. And since they had not, even after being notified, the assumption was that there must not be anything to it. Therefore it was not even going to be investigated. And so there, my friends, is a part of the handwriting on the wall for America. Most all Americans have been tricked into accepting the idea that only the Federal Government counts or is able to do anything, even though this idea is totally alien to our Republic as originally founded. All the Federal Government has to do is not act or to remain silent about a matter such as Soviet missiles in our waters, and people conveniently leap to the conclusion that there must not be any missiles. As General Keegan says, we're becoming incapable of being warned, and my friends, if we don't snap out of it, we will suffer horribly. The fact that something was afoot in the area of our nation's water supplies should have been realized four years ago when Nelson Rockefeller started his National Commission on Water Quality. This he started at the same time as his much better known Commission on Critical Choices for Americans. And just as the Commission on Critical Choices was absorbed into the Federal Government in everything but name, the same was done with Rockefeller's Commission on Water Quality. But even if it was clear that water was to become a political tool in some way, I doubt that anyone in his worst nightmares imagined what was actually afoot. Over the past several years Federal and State Water Con Quality Control Boards have built up a comprehensive and up-to-date picture of our nation's water resources and requirements, and all this data has been turned over to the Soviet Union. So now the Soviets know exactly where and how to strike at us through our Achilles Hill of water, just as the Medes and Persians were able to calculate how to attack ancient Babylon through its water source. In the alliance between the Rockefeller and the Soviet Union empires, the Rockefeller brothers still want to rule the American continent under complete dictatorship, and the Soviets still want America to become their complete satellite, a nation of slaves. But the Rockefellers realized long ago that this country could not be brought under the total control they desire without the benefit of crushing disasters to force us into that mold. 
and the Soviets for their part realize that to extract the benefit from America that they seek, it is not enough simply to conquer us in war. Afterward, there must be a corps of turncoat managers, Quislings, to run America for them. Soon the Rockefellers expect to obtain the declaration of national emergency that they want in response to events which can be triggered by the Soviets. The declaration of national emergency, they believe, will make their dictatorship all but complete. At the present time the Soviet Union has at least 158 underwater missiles in our territorial waters along our coastlines. In addition, the Great Lakes now bristle with smaller single warhead Soviet underwater missiles, a total of 53 as of my latest information. The fact that the Soviet Union has been able to invade the Great Lakes and place missiles there is shocking. And it is even more shocking to know that Soviet agents are fanning out all over the United States unhampered to sow seeds of nuclear disaster throughout our land. It's hard for most people to imagine how such things are possible, but as I know from my own sources, they are being facilitated from within our country. For example, one of the key steps which has been taken by the Carter Administration to permit these things recently was publicly confirmed by former Congressman John Rarick of Louisiana. Congressman Rarick publishes a very informative monthly newsletter entitled You Have a Right to Know, about which you might write uh, to him at Drawer E, St. Francisville, Louisiana, Zip 70775. Quoting from his March 1977 issue, the Soviets are hauling United States cargo in intracoastal shipping illegally against the provisions of the Jones Act. Russian vessels can be seen in the river loading from barges and also unloading on two barges as if they constitute an integral arm of the United States Maritime Service. Barges loaded by Soviets have been followed up the river through inland waterways and small canals to where their cargoes have even reached the Chicago market." Unquote. Congressman Rarick further reports that the Soviets are able to get away with this because Secretary of the Treasury Blumenthal waived the provisions of the Jones Act as applied to Soviet vessels. Thanks to such generous help from within, the United States has been thrown wide open to offensive Soviet actions. As a result, the planting of, of nuclear devices in our inland waters, rivers as well as lakes and reservoirs is mushrooming at a tremendous pace. To begin with, additional bombs have been planted in some of the huge dammed up lakes that I named last month. For example, Hoover Dam had one bomb when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 23, but now it has three, one next to each end of the dam itself, the third upstream some distance from the dam. Another example is Oroville Reservoir in California. Last month it had one bomb, now it has four. But more serious than this overkill of a few dams is the vast number of targets throughout America where Soviet bombs have been and are being planted. City water reservoirs of any significance throughout America are targeted. Many already contain bombs, while others are scheduled to receive bombs from the many trucks fanning out across America with Soviet agents at the wheel. Flood control, irrigation, and hydroelectric dams of all kinds are targets as well, and major rivers are also being seeded with bombs at strategic points. To indicate the magnitude of the Soviet attack plan, I will report the current status of just one state, Texas, which is a major target. As of my latest intelligence, over 100 bombs have already been planted in Texas, and I have been provided so far with a partial list that specifies 33 of the lakes involved. These are Toledo Bend Reservoir, Sam Rayburn Reservoir, Stein Hilliers Reservoir, Lake Vernon, two lakes northeast of Houston, 
which provide water for the city, Conroe Lake, Somerville Reservoir, Lake Waco, Lake Whitney, Malakoff Lake, Frankston Lake, Lake Livingston, Millwood Reservoir, Lake Texarkana, Lake of the Pines, Cedar Lake, Lake Tawakone, four water reservoirs for Dallas and Fort Worth, Lake Texoma, Arbuckle Reservoir, Lake Bridgeport, Hubbard Creek Reservoir, Lake Kemp, Lake Arrowhead, Ofala Reservoir, San Angelo Reservoir, Twin Buttes Reservoir, Lake Thomas, and White River Reservoir. A number of rivers around the country are also known to be involved already. These include the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Illinois, the Ohio, the Columbia, the Potomac, and the Susquehanna. In the Mississippi alone there are already 31 bombs located near dams and locks and other strategic points. The farthest to the north is a bomb about five miles downstream of Little Falls, Minnesota. From there they have all been planted all the way down to New Orleans or Louisiana where two bombs are in the river. There are also two other bombs near New Orleans at the east end of Lake Pontchartrain. My friends, the Soviet Union is striving to be in a position to suddenly, decisively rob America of our water resources. While we are distracted with arguments over weapons delivery systems such as bombers and missiles, the Soviet Union is striving for the reliability of weapons that are already on site at the target. When war comes, the Soviet Union plans to be able to just push a button, detonate nuclear weapons all over America, devastate our country with floods and the pestilence that they bring, and still have all their missiles and bombers still in reserve. But before war comes, the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance plan to lay the groundwork for a declaration of national emergency in the United States. One option still available to them is war in the Middle East causing a cutoff of Arab OPEC oil supplies. But a horrendous new capability is now in place as an alternate means for creating our national emergency, and my friends, there are ominous signs that this capability is going to be used very soon. Lurking deep in the waters around the Philippine Islands, there are now seven fission-fusion fission bombs planted there by the Soviet Union. Such a bomb is essentially a hydrogen bomb with a jacket of Uranium-238. When it's set off, the nuclear reaction converts much of the jacket material to Plutonium-239, which in turn explodes as well. The Soviet Union is the only nation that has ever set off such a bomb 16 years ago on October 30, 1961. In doing so, they set an ugly record that still stands, the biggest nuclear weapon ever fired in the atmosphere. Its yield was something over 50 megatons, that is, 50 million tons of TNT, 2,500 times as large as the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Theoretically, there's no limit to the yield of such a bomb, but for 16 years it has been thought of in the West as unusable because it produces such vast quantities of fallout that it would endanger the country that used it. But the Soviet Union has found a way to use it, deep under the ocean for geophysical warfare in an environment where the radioactive products are relatively confined, producing little fallout. The Philippines sit like a keystone among a long arch of subsea trenches and faults that comprise the most earthquake-prone areas on Earth. Starting just north of New Zealand, a band of geological instability runs northwestward toward the Philippines then northeastward past Japan to the Kamchatka Peninsula, eastward along the Aleutians to Alaska, and then southward along the west coast of the United States, Mexico, Central America, and onward all the way to Chile. This long, irregular zone around the Pacific Rim is often called the Ring of Fire. 
The seven Soviet bombs planted in Philippine waters are there for the purpose of triggering major earthquakes, which, thanks to the peculiar convergence of faults and trenches in that area, are intended to work their way by chain reaction all around the Pacific Rim, devastating Washington State, Oregon, and California in the process. The seven bombs in the Philippines are in the so-called Gigaton Range. That is, each one is equivalent to a billion tons of TNT, 50,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, and therefore big enough to trigger massive earthquakes. And the Soviets believe they can safely use such warfare, treaties or no treaties, because most of the Soviet Union has no history of earthquakes. The Soviet Gigaton bombs in the Philippines are located at navigational coordinates which I will now reveal. Number 1 is at 17, 23, 23 north, 117, 7, 23 east. Number 2 is at 14, 48, 48 north, 119, 2, 18 east. Number 3 is at 14, 0, 40 north. 118, 23, 53 east. Number 4 is at 13, 0, 0 north. 117, 42, 8 east. Number 5 is at 12, 0, 54 north. 126, 4, 55 east. Number 6 is at 13, 50, 36 north. 125, 21, 45 east. Number 7 is at 19, 48, 3 north. 123, 51, 57 east. But to make sure that our west coast is devastated by the effects of a seeming natural disaster erupting in the Philippines, a series of seven conventional but large hydrogen bombs have been planted off our west coast by the Soviet Union. These can be set off in conjunction with those in the Philippines and at the right moment to produce tidal waves which would sweep in from the Pacific with devastating effect along our west coast. Bomb No. 1, west of Seattle, is at 48, 0, 0 north, 127, 50, 0 west. No. 2, west of Eugene, Oregon, is at 43, 29, 18 north, 127, 55, 5 west. No. 3, west of San Francisco, is at 37, 8, 45 north, 125, 42, 30 west. No. 4, west of Monterey, is at 36, 31, 0 north, 125, 26, 30 west. No. 5, also west of Monterey, is at 36, 26, 30 north, 124, 56, 0 west. No. 6, west of Los Angeles, is at 33, 25, 15 north, 122, 23, 50 west. And No. 7, southwest of San Diego, is at 31, 45, 35 north, 120, 36, 0 west. In my AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977, I refer to a warning document issued in December 1975 by Mr. Tony Hodges of Hawaii. In that document Mr. Hodges presented evidence of the feasibility of underwater missiles. He also warned of the dangers of bombs on or in the seabed designed to generate earthquakes or tidal waves. Unfortunately, it turns out that Mr. Hodges' warnings were all valid. The dictatorship and war plans are being speeded up now. The world will be stunned by what will look like a massive natural disaster in the Philippines that also spreads around the Ring of Fire to decimate our west coast. And when it happens, Jimmy Carter will have the excuse David Rockefeller wants him to have to declare a national emergency and, in effect, suspend the United States Constitution. The President's dictatorial emergency powers, spelled out in Executive Orders 11490 and 11921, will be activated, and the complete bureaucracy of dictatorship set in motion under circumstances designed to stifle all dissent and the elaborate prescriptions for complete governmental control of all of our water resources, spelled out in Executive Order 11921, will be activated under conditions which enable this to be sold to the people as necessary for our best interest. Soon thereafter, 
with the Rockefeller dictatorship in place, Nuclear War I itself is planned to come. Dams and reservoirs all over America are to be destroyed at one blow by the Soviet Union, and the Quislings from the Trilateral Commission who now control the Federal Government will use their control over what little remains of our water supplies to make their domination of us total. The saddest thing about all of this is that only when it happens will people believe. By total exposure there is a chance to prevent the West Coast disaster, but without exposure there is no chance whatsoever. My friends, it's only by the grace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ that I've received the information I revealed over the recent past, and it's my solemn duty to pass on this information to you. It's not meant for me alone. And in the same way it's not meant for you alone. It needs to be known by everyone. And so, my friends, this completes two years of my monthly AUDIO letters. I want to thank you for all your words of encouragement, your support, and especially your prayers. Again, thank you and may God bless each and every one of you.